So Caroline read nearly an entire Dr. Seuss book this morning. I'm so proud of her. Oh, I remember when Delaney read Dr. Seuss. <laughs> She's beyond that? Oh, we're on to chapter books now. Although Dr. Seuss books are good. Did I say Dr. Seuss books? I meant a biography on Dr. Seuss. She read a biography? I don't want to brag. <laughs> Delaney would struggle with a biography in most languages. K-E. Coke. We were both wrong. So how's Brian? Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Work is just picking up and it's just really busy. Same with Paul. Even busier. We all have a comparison problem, don't we? Any of you guys can relate to that video? All right, and I know for me, I, I totally have this problem. I see this problem, you know, this thing happening in my life all the time. And I don't know if any of you guys, you know, do any of those events where you have to get dressed and you hear business casual. You guys know? And so you think, well, what is business casual? All right, and so you get dressed and you go to this event, banquet, whatever it is, and the first thing you do when you walk through the door is look around and you make sure that you look like everybody else, okay? Because whatever this business casual, you don't want to stick out. You're, you don't want to be the one, you know, the only person wearing a tie or, you know, wearing a suit jacket, whatever it is. And so we all, we all do this. We all compare each other, ourselves to each other, okay? And uh, I don't know if you guys, you guys, kids, any of you guys have kids, obviously, um, I just became a father, and I got to go to a really cool birthday party yesterday. It was a birthday party for a one-year-old, and it was awesome. And, you know, we're having a great time, and it was the Youngs, Hannah's uh, first birthday party. And Mike Young brings out this tub of ice cream. I'm not kidding you. It's like a five-gallon uh, tub of ice cream. And I'm going, I'm going to have me some of that. Okay, so he, he opens it up, I grab a plate, and I start scooping bowls of ice cream. And his little son, Jake, he's four years old, comes to me and he says, can I have some ice cream? I said, okay, well now I get to have the job of scooping everyone ice cream, which is awesome. So all the kids start lining up. And, you know, he, he, I guess he had looked at my plate because he asked me, I, I scooped him two scoops, and then he asked me and said, Omar, can I have three more scoops of ice cream? I said, okay, sure. So I start scooping him more ice cream, and he's got this big blob. And Amy looks at this, and he goes, hey, Omar, or, uh, Jake, go show your dad what Mr. Omar scooped for you on your plate. And so I learned two things. First thing that I learned is that this comparison thing starts very young, okay? <laughs> Second thing that I learned is don't scoop a four-year-old five, six scoops of ice cream. That, that's just not a good idea. And um, we also see this comparison thing during Christmas, don't we? You know, we, we, we get into these circles, and it's Christmas Eve. Uh, we actually open our uh, presents Christmas Eve. I don't know if you guys do that. And so we're sitting around, and, you know, people are getting their presents. And by the end of it, you're going, wait a second. How come my brother got six presents, and he got the expensive Xbox, and I just got cologne? You know, and, 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 and this reminds me of probably the best Christmas I've ever experienced in my entire life. You guys all have that one, right? Can you guys think back to, like, the best Christmas you've ever had? For me, it was 1994, okay? So we're going to go way back to 1994. And back then, Power Rangers were huge. Any, any, anyone a Power Ranger fan? No? Any? Woo! Yeah, my wife. Anybody else? Okay. So... Power Rangers. Let me tell you about the Power Rangers, okay? I mean, this was the craze. You guys remember, like, the Tickle Me Elmo thing? Okay? So we'd watch this show. It was amazing. It was great. And the toys were the big deal. Okay? So not only did you watch the toys, you had to, I mean, not only did you watch the show, you had to have the toys. Okay? And so we've got the, the you know, I, I'm, I'm like, okay, Christmas is coming up. I'm going to ask Santa for all the Power Ranger toys, because that's, that's going to be awesome. And it's going to be great. So I talked to Santa. I said, Santa, look, I, I need all the Power Ranger toys. OK, 
Okay, and so Christmas Eve comes around, and, you know, and actually they had saved it for the next day. And so I, I close my eyes, wake up the next morning, and I'm not kidding you, it was like presents everywhere. Okay, I'm like, woo, yeah, this is awesome. Okay, and so one of the first things I opened up was the Red Dragon Thunder Zord, okay, which was awesome. I'm like, yes, this is so great. Best Christmas ever. My brother and I were just having a great time. Next thing I open up, I open up the Thunder Zord Assault Team. I'm going, man, this is going to be a good Christmas. And then open up the White Tiger Zord. And I'm going, wow, that was my favorite. Okay, and so I, I, we're, my brother and I are just jumping up and down. We grab all our stuff, and we start walking to our neighbor's house because we're going we're gonna to show John Carmichael, okay? <laughs> we're going to show John Carmichael what we got for Christmas. So we're walking over, and we walk in. We're like, John, check this out. Look what we got. And so come to find out that John had gotten everything that we had got, plus <laughs> tore the shuttle sword. Okay? We didn't get tore the shuttle sword. And so we couldn't make the ultra thunder sword. <laughs> okay? Because look, you need tore the shuttle sword to make the ultra thunder sword. Okay, and so this comparison thing totally ruined my Christmas because now we couldn't make Thor, the, I mean, the Ultra Thunder Zord. Okay, and so you see this, this comparison thing, it's kind of, it hurts, doesn't it? Because we look around, we go, wait a second, I don't have that, I don't have this. Okay, and a lot of us with this comparison thing, we, we start to gauge ourselves, we start to, to ask ourselves, are we okay by just looking around? And we make decisions based on what everyone else is doing. Okay? And um, we don't realize we're doing it. A lot of us don't even realize that we're, we're doing this comparison thing. Okay? We're just like, hey, you know what? I'm just uh, going along my day, and you just naturally do it. It's, it's human nature. Okay? And uh, some of us, we just want more er in our, in our lives, don't we? We just want more er. Okay? And so we want to be rich er. We want to be skinny er. We want to be smarter. We want to be taller, prettier, happier, hip-er, more talented-er. <laughs> okay? Because that's, that's what we need, right? When, you, when you, people think of you, you want those adjectives being thrown out. All right? And then there's another side to that, isn't there? Because then we can look down, because you can compare up and say, oh, well, you know, there's a richer person, the prettier person. But then we compare down, don't we? And we say, well, look at that. There's... There's a heavier person, there's a poorer per person, there's a shorter person, there's a nerdier person. And when we look at those people, we feel more superior-er. Okay, because we're like, oh, well, I feel good because that person is way shorter than me. You know, and, and you, know, I, you know, I'm tall, dark, and handsome. And then there's the short, bald guys, you know, and... And so you're comparing, and you feel good about yourself, right? You feel good about yourself when you compare to other people, okay? And so what happens? We go through life, we want more er, and then we get married, don't we? And what happens when we get married? We want our wife to have more ers, don't we? So we say, oh, man, she needs to be, you know, richer, skinnier, or funnier, you know, and then... Uh, we go on and, and, and we, we say, well, you know, I just, I'm pushing them. Because that pushback on that is, you know what, I'm pushing my family, I'm pushing them to be, uh, to reach their full potential, right? But in reality, what are you really doing? You just want to look good, you know, because this comparison thing, we just want to look good. And then what happens after you get married? What, what comes next? You have kids. And then guess what happens when you have kids? You start pushing more errs on them. So you say, you know what? I want you to be smarter. I want you to be faster. And, and we push them academically, and we drive them nuts. A lot of, them, a lot of us drive our kids nuts because we just want them to be, because they're an extension of us, aren't they? And so we're like, no, we want you to be the smartest, and we want you to go to the best schools, and we want you to have the highest GPA. When in reality, what are you doing? You're just looking at other people's kids, and you're going, wait, they are up a grade, and they're playing up in sports, and that's what we want. 
And is it really about them? Is it really about them? It's about you. It's about how you look. And so that's the challenge. That's what we're going to be looking at uh, today. Now, before I do, i got to talk to you guys about a different class, okay? Some of you guys are not content with just being er, okay? You want to be in a completely different class on your own, and you want to be est. And so you want to be richest, you want to be smartest, you want to be happiest, you want to be healthiest, and you want to be retweetest. That one's for Marty, okay? Unfortunately, he only has like five friends, so... Please, if you're on Twitter, get on Twitter and start following him because he really needs to retweet stuff, and it's a big deal for him. But it's okay. It's okay. We'll just... And so we we have this problem, guys. We compare up and we compare down. Okay? We we, we look and we say, when we see these people that are richer than us, that have the nicer house, have the nicer home, and then we look down and we say, well, I'm okay because I'm, I'm better than this person. So... We have, we all have this comparison problem. I don't want to hear any excuses. I don't want to hear any any people say, no, I don't have this problem. Okay, because we all do it to some degree. Okay? And so if you get anything out of this sermon, it's this, okay? And, and, And this is the big takeaway. This is the big point. I want you guys to take a little three by five card, write this on the card, put it in your car, put it in the bathroom, and it's this, okay? Is that there is no win. In comparison. There's no win in comparison, okay? Because all of us, we, and, and, and uh, you know, wrestling with this, like you think about it, and you're like, well, no, isn't comparison good? And, and I'm here to tell you, there is no win in comparison. It does not matter if you're better than somebody else, if you're faster than somebody else, if you're richer than somebody else, okay? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're not measuring up to someone, it okay? doesn't matter if, if, if you're, you know, you're living in a smaller house than all of your friends. It doesn't matter if you're driving the Honda versus you know, the Mercedes. All of it doesn't matter. Okay? Because what is it? Isn't it perspective? It's perspective. It's how we look at things. It's how we are experiencing life. That's, that's what it's really about. And so today, we want to go ahead and, 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 and I'm going to give you guys some stuff to really help change our perspective on this comparison thing. Um, and, you know, and with this comparison thing, it's kind of dangerous because some of us have gotten to the point where, as we compare, it, it's, it's brought this, this depression onto us, okay? And, and let me put up a slide and for our, go back to uh, the one before, the one before that. And it, it's brought this, this thought, you will never be as blank as them. Okay, you will never be as blank as them. And so you fill it in. I'll never be as pretty as them. I'll never be as rich as them. I'll never be you know, as tall. I'll never be as smart. And so this comparison brings on almost a depression. It brings on this, this sense of, you know, I'm not good enough. And so does God call you to be depressed about things? You're a child of God. God wants the best for you. So you see how this comparison thing is dangerous? It brings you down, okay? And, and, and really, with this danger, you know, a lot of us, as we compare, has, hasn't it put us into, some of us, into debt because we're comparing? Because we say, you know what? And, and my wife almost, and my wife and I almost fell into this trap the other day. We were looking at our house, and we're going, wait a second, we need a bigger house. <laughs> we need a bigger house. And we have a great house. We have a great house. But in our minds, we started looking around, and we started looking at all the people that we hung out with, and we said, well, they all live in Anthem. Why, why, don't, we, why don't we get a bigger house? You know, why don't we get a, a nicer car? So we all fall into this, and we, we, we fall into debt because of this. Some of you guys have purchased things that you shouldn't have purchased. You know, some of you are wearing clothes that you shouldn't be wearing. Because you, well, you know what I mean. You know what I mean? Everyone should be wearing clothes right now, okay? <laughs> but you guys are, you know, going to the high-end places and going, you know, I'm going to get me some Versace, and I'm going to get me some Gucci, and I'm going to look good. Okay, I'm going to look good. Some of you guys are driving things, living in things, and wearing things that you guys shouldn't be wearing, and the only reason you did it is because of other people. That's the only reason. And so is that freedom? Is that freedom? 
Because God calls you to be free, doesn't he? And so if you're making decisions based on other people, is that freedom? It's not. So we gotta, we got to get it out of our heads. And uh, the Jewish leaders in the Bible did, did the same thing. Hey, they looked around, they compared themselves, and there was this guy named Jesus walking around, and he was doing these amazing things. And what did they do? They compared themselves to, to him and said, we need to crucify this. And here's, uh, they handed it over, over to Pilate, the Jewish leaders did, and this is what Pilate said. He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. So the truth is, is that this comparison thing is very much rooted in envy or jealousy. Okay, that's the root of it. And uh, the, the other slide that I have for you guys is Proverbs. And it says this, Envy is like cancer in the bones. Envy is like cancer in the bones. And so as we do this comparison thing and we start to envy and we have this jealousy, we start to rot away. We're never happy. We're never satisfied with what we have. So what do we do? You know, what, what is it that we do? What does God call us? You know, how do I motivate, motivate my spouse to be better to do better without falling into this comparison trap? You know, how do I get my kids to work hard? How do I work hard without falling into this comparison trap? And so today, we're going to be looking at the book of Ecclesiastes to find, uh, you know, a great insight on this. And the book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. Anyone know Solomon? Solomon? Okay, Solomon was known as the greatest king of his time. And the reason why is because he had, you know, he had a whole bunch of stuff. First thing he had, he had more wives than that show the sister wives or whatever, okay? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's just the truth. We try to kind of sketch over it as we flip through the Bible, but he had like 300-something wives, okay? So he was a busy guy, all right? <laughs> Second thing, he was rich, richest guy of his time, richest guy of his time. I mean, he had more gold than Fort Knox. Okay, this guy was rich, well, probably just as rich as Bill Gates. I mean, that guy's got billions of dollars. Um, he also built one of the seven wonders of the world in the ancient time, which was the temple of, of God. So this was a huge, huge deal. And most importantly, Solomon had wisdom beyond his, his years. He had supernatural wisdom that God had given him because he asked for it. He prayed, God, give me wisdom. And so God gave him this wisdom to be able to make these decisions. And so all these kings and all these queens would go and make their way to see Solomon and ask him, Solomon, what should I do? How should I do this? And so Solomon was very smart, and he looked at this problem of comparison, and he said, you know, I, I have a few ideas, and here's a, a few things on how we can uh, better ourselves in this. And here's what he said. He said, then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. But this too is meaningless, like chasing after the wind. Fools fold their idle hands, leading them to ruin. And yet, better to have one hand full with quietness than two hands full with hard work and chasing the wind. And so let's go ahead and break this down. Okay, so let's, let's look at the first part. Then I observed that most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. So Solomon's looking around and he's saying, you know what? I see this problem. 3,000 years ago, I'm seeing these people and they're just working, working really hard. And they're pushing themselves. They're trying to gain this stuff, gain gold, gain recognition. And it's all motivated by their envy for their neighbors. And uh, Marty talked about that last week, didn't he? Who are our neighbors? Everyone. It's people. And so it's Everyone in this room, it's not just your physical neighbor. Okay? And so we have this envy for each other, and this envy pushes us to want to have the bigger car, to want to have the bigger house. Okay? And, and you know, envy, there's no love in envy. But this, too, is meaningless, like chasing the wind. And so he comes to the conclusion, he says, look, guys, I'm telling you right now, this is meaningless. Because he's looking at the scope of the big picture of you know, what, what is the meaning of life? And if you guys want to read a great book, read Ecclesiastes. The, the conclusion that he comes to in Ecclesiastes is just amazing. So go home and spend time with Ecclesiastes. I won't, we won't get into it, but it's a great, great, great book. And so he says it's meaningless. It's like chasing 
the wind. Now, I love, love, love that, um, you know, that, that view. I mean, imagine, how many of you guys are going to leave here today and go chase the wind? I mean, really, are you guys going to go bottle up some wind? That's impossible. It is impossible. The wind, no one knows where it comes from. It, you know, the Bible says we don't know where it comes from. We don't, we don't know where it's going to end. And so this thing of where we're, you know, we are uh, just trying to compare and get, 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 doesn't do anything. It doesn't, it, all it leads to is meaninglessness and chasing after the wind. There's no end. There's no stop to it. And then he says this. Well, you guys are going, asking yourselves, well, then what are we supposed to do? We're not supposed to do anything. Everything is meaningless. And what are we supposed to do? And here's what Sol- Solomon says. He says, fools fold their hands, their idle hands, leading them to ruin. And so he's making that point. He's saying, look, guys, I'm not saying don't be productive. I'm not saying don't be productive. Because that's the pushback, isn't it? Well, what are you, you're, Omar, you're telling me that I can't be productive now because I'm doing this comparison thing? No. And we're talking about Solomon here, Okay. 300 wives, lots of gold, built the temple. I mean, this guy was busy. And you think about Jesus. Okay, Jesus. Was Jesus productive? I mean, think about what he did in three years. We all wish we could do what Jesus did in three years. Okay, so we're not talking about productivity here. Okay, but uh, Solomon gives us a different perspective, a different view of what this productivity should look like. And here's what he says. And, and, and if you, I mean, this, this is gold right here, guys. You guys all need to write this down. It, this is so good. Better to have one handful with quietness than two handfuls with hard work and chasing the wind. Okay, and the imagery here is so, so great, isn't it? Because what is he saying? He's saying, look, it's better to have one hand open with tranquility. And what is one, what is openness uh, signify? What does it show us, you know, with God? That we're open to him, aren't we? And so when we have one hand open, we're saying, you know what, God? I am content to, to, that whatever you give me and whatever you take away, I'm content with that. I'm content with one hand full in my life. Okay? I mean, this is a perspective that he wants us to get. Rather than two hands full with hard work. Okay, so then, in the, in the, 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 the Hebrew says two uh, clenched fists. Two clenched fists. And so imagine, we, we start doing this comparison thing. We start trying to attain. We start trying to gain all these things. And Solomon compares it to having two clenched fists as you're trying to go out throughout life. And you're trying to gain, 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 and you're never, ever satisfied. You're just trying to get. Okay, and, and, and look, are you open to God when you have two clenched fists? Are you open to him for, for him to take whatever he, he needs to take? It's not submission, is it? Because as Christians, God calls us to be submissive to him. And he says, you know what? I got this. Don't worry about it. I, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. Whatever you need, I'm going to give to you. But we take matters into our own hands, don't we? And we say, you know what, God? No, I, I want to do this myself. I don't trust you. I trust myself. And so I'm going to take, 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 and I'm going to grab. And then, you know, the, the best way I could, uh, I could illustrate this is for, for you guys is my, my little daughter. Okay, she's almost six months old, and she does this. Like, we put a bunch of toys in front of her, and here's what she does. She'll start grabbing one toy, okay, and then she'll start playing with it, and then she's like, she'll start grabbing another toy, and then she's got two toys. And then she's not content with what she's got in her two hands, so she tries to to reach for more, and she can't do it. She doesn't have any more hands to grasp onto what she's trying to do, so then she just throws and grabs more and more, and she's never content. And finally, all the toys are all around her in the car, and we're like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> like, and, and, and it starts early, doesn't it? Because it's, it's human nature. It's, it's in all of us, okay, to do this thing. And with two hands full, chasing the wind. And Solomon doesn't stop there. Solomon doesn't stop there. He gives you another great story and illustration. Here's what he says. I observed yet another example of something meaningless under the sun. This is the case of a man who is all alone, without a child or a brother, yet who works hard to gain as much wealth as he can, 
But then he asks himself, who am I working for? Why am I giving up so much pleasure now? It's all so meaningless and depressing. Okay, so let's break it down real quick. So he's talking about this man who's all alone without child or brother. And in this, this culture, we know that women weren't able to inherit any of, of their husband's stuff. So he has no one to leave his stuff to. All, this, all these things that he's working towards, he has no one to leave it to. Yet, works hard to gain as much wealth as he can. I know that I've fallen into that trap. I fall into this, this trap all the time, where I'm like, I just need more. You know, I, if I just had more money, I'd be able to provide you know, for my family and this, and be able to take more vacations, and do this, and do that, and do that. And then he asks himself, who am I working for, and why am I giving up so much pleasure now? And this man comes to a point in his life that a lot of us, first of all, haven't come to yet. We haven't asked this hard question. And the question is that, who am I working for? Who am I doing this for? Because a lot of you will say, oh, I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it for... But are you really? I mean, if you really look deep down inside, is that what you're really doing it for? Because a lot of you are workaholics. And so you're not able to have your you know, pleasure now. You don't even enjoy the stuff that you have because you're working, 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 trying to get more and more and more and more and more. So you've got all this stuff, but yet you're over here trying to do more, trying to get more. It's all so meaningless and depressing. So why don't we take some advice from one of the wisest men of all time and stop it. Let's stop it. Okay, let's pray. We're done. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> let's stop it, guys. Yeah, we could just, let's just, because here's the thing. If we go to the next slide. What or who I'm using as my reference point, or uh, actually go to the one next to this one. Where do I look for my value, and how do I choose to respond to those around me is a choice. It is a choice. You guys are choosing to look around you and have that competition. Okay? You guys are choosing to find your value and for students, your GPA, for you adults, how much money you're making, the type of house that you live in, okay? how well your kids are doing in school. That's all your choice. Okay? And he, here's the question that I, I kind of, I have a few things that I want to leave you guys with as, as we end. Okay, what or who am I using as my reference point to tell me that I'm okay? What? Or who am I using as my reference point to tell me that I'm okay? Because every single one of you is using a reference point. That's either a person or that's either some type of achievement that you're trying to make. And I'm guilty of this. I, I, I do this with a lot of uh, my younger friends. I look at them and I'm going, oh, well, uh, they got the kids. Uh, well, they have two kids, so we have to have two kids. And, and you don't realize you're doing it, but you're, you're doing it. And you're making choices. You're making decisions based on what everyone else is doing. And I fall into this trap all the time. And a lot of us, like I said earlier, we do it unconsciously. We don't even realize we're doing it. And, and you know, as, as I'm thinking about this comparison, I'm going, whoa, whoa, I do this all the time. I do this all the time. And so what are you using? Are you using academics? Are you using your family? Okay, are you using uh, your job? And catch yourself, guys, because here's the thing. We need to change our perspective, don't we? We need to catch ourselves before we start going to the two hands, the, the handfuls. Okay, because better one hand with tranquility, that's what, that's what Solomon says, better have one hand with whatever you can get with one hand and be, you know, be peaceful. You know, be content with what you have. Be content with what's in front of you than to have two clenched fists chasing and chasing and chasing and never reaching a finish line, never reaching that point where you say, you know what, yes. Because if you have that mindset, you're always going to be searching. You're always going to be trying to grasp uh, more. So what are you using as your reference point? And then um, I want to leave you guys with a few questions, okay? And, and this is just reflection. 
Okay, and, and, and for some of you, you guys need to write some of these down because this is exactly where you're at. Are you exhausted from trying to keep up with blank? Can you fill in a name there? Okay, because a lot of us, we're not content with the eight-foot ceilings. You know, we're, we want the 10-foot ceiling. You know, we want the bigger family room. You know, we want to be, uh, have the better job than, you know, our best friend. Better job than he has. A better job than our brother or sister. Are you broke from trying to keep up with blank? Are you spending money that you shouldn't be spending? Because you're trying to, you know, keep up this facade with whoever it is. Hey, look at us. We're going to the boat. We're doing this. And you're spending money you shouldn't be spending. Are you allowing what others have to keep you from enjoying what you have? That's a huge one. Okay, so you're looking at everyone else's stuff and you're going, I want that. And yet you have, you know, you want three jet skis. Okay, but you have two already. <laughs> like, seriously, calm, calm down. Enjoy the two that you have. Stop chasing the third one. <laughs> you know, we do this. Okay, so enjoy the stuff that you have. Are you allowing what you don't have to keep you from enjoying what you do have? So we're all trying to attain more stuff and we're not enjoying the stuff that we have. Do you enjoy your kids or are you driving them crazy because of everyone else's kids and what they're doing and accomplishing? And parents, I think this is a huge one for you guys. This is huge. I know that for me personally, I have a six-month-old. I'm not quite there yet, but I can see myself getting there. Allie and I, we talk and we're like, all right, this is what we want for her and this is what... Parents, you guys need to really look at that one because we want to push our kids. And, and, and you say, well, no, we're trying to motivate them. We're trying to get them to do their best, full potential. But really, deep down inside, if you search your heart, it's about you. Try to discipline your kid and, and keep them looking a certain way because if you have that bratty you know, five-year-old and everyone's like, oh my gosh, look at the bratty five-year-olds. Oh, look at the parents. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. And so you're like trying to discipline why? Because you don't want to look bad in front of the other parents. You want your kid to be like everybody else. Is it possible that your spouse feels like you're dissatisfied with him or her because your tendency to make comparisons to other husbands or wives? This one, this, <laughs> this one happens all the time. And even Allie, I mean, you know, she's no saint. She'll come up to him and be like, well, so-and-so does this for their child, and how come you don't do that for your child? I'm like, seriously? Did that, did that help at all? Did that help the situation at all? No, it doesn't. It doesn't help, you know, to tell your husband or wife that this person's doing this and comparing them to somebody else. It, it doesn't, because then what happens? They go, okay, well, yeah, I need to work on that. And then now they're motivated, and their motivation comes from what? Comparison. And so they're going, oh, well, i got to do this, and, and now i got to be like him. And in the end, they do it, and you're like, oh, well, that, that's meaningless. There was no meaning to that. And the last one, oh, uh, second to last, how would you secretly enjoy, who would you secretly enjoy seeing fail relationally, financially, and professionally? This one's, this one's tough. Because when we do this envy thing, and when we do this jealousy thing, and we do this comparison thing, our the sin inside of us does this thing. We secretly want to see people fail. I know I, I'm totally guilty of this. Very unconsciously I do it, and I'm reading this, I'm going, yeah. You know? It's terrible. It's, it's like, ugh, it's, it's human nature. It's, it's dirty. You know, like, we need to get over this. We need to overcome this. And the last one is this. Are you chasing the wind? Are you chasing the wind? Because a lot of us are. A lot of us in this room are chasing the wind. And it's meaningless. What does Solomon say? There's no point to it. There's no end. There's no finish line. And so three three points I want to leave you with, and I'd suggest that you write these down. Is it impossible? It is impossible to love someone if you're pushing him or her to excel that you will feel better about yourself. It is impossible to love someone 
if you're pushing him or her to excel so that you will feel better about yourself. And what does God call us to do? What is the first greatest commandments? What does he say? Love your neighbor. So you can't be loving if you're doing this thing. Second one, you can't love someone that you secretly hope will fail so that you will feel better about yourself. That's not love. Okay? Secretly wishing that someone will fail or that their marriage will fail. Some of us do that. They're like, oh, gosh, they have such a happy marriage. And then you hear the first time you hear that they're fighting, you're going, oh, my gosh, that's so sad. And you're going, yes. <laughs> yes, they're not perfect. Yes. Okay? You can't chase the wind and follow Jesus at the same time. You can't chase the wind and follow Jesus at the same time. Let me pray for us and we'll be done. Father God, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, Lord. And I just pray that we come back for a second week of uh, this series called Comparison Trap, Lord, so we can learn to look at you and use you as our mirror, God when we do this comparison thing. And Father, I just pray that you help us with this, Lord. Help us to be content with one hand open, with tranquility, and when two hands clenched so tight and grasping, trying to get more and more and more, and never being satisfied with what we have, Lord. And we pray these things in your name. Amen.